So the reaction furnace. And this is the vessel where the thermal combustion reaction takes place. So this free flame reaction is inside the reactor refractory lined vessel. This is also where the majority of the overall conversion of H2S to sulfur occurs. And that can be anywhere from 50 to 75 percent conversion. Our temperatures can be anywhere from 900 to 1350 degrees Celsius. 900 is a little cold. That's kind of our minimum stable flame temperature. We like to recommend 1050 in a gas plant, and that's to ensure all our BTEX and other contaminants are destroyed. In a refinery where there's the SWS feed stream containing ammonia, we recommend 1150 minimum, and that's to destroy the ammonia. Now there's many side reactions in the reaction furnace, and these all create unwanted products like CO, H2, and then the main ones, COS and CS2. The sulfur vapor created in this is in the form of S2. And like I mentioned before, for sufficient flame stability, we want a minimum temperature of 900 degrees Celsius, which is 1650 Fahrenheit. And temperatures above 1050 are desired for adequate destruction of contaminants like BTEX, mercaptans, NH3, cyanide, and methanol and hydrocarbons. The reaction furnace is kinetically limited based on reaction time, turbulence, and temperature, as well as burner efficiency. So this is a nice comparison of a computer simulated temperature profile in the reaction, in the thermal reaction chamber. So A is a simple concentric pipe, per, pipe burner design, and B is a sophisticated high efficiency feed gas mixing burner. It's a finer cylindrical burner tip and creates a nice even flame, even heat distribution, and good mixing. Now this temperature chart is sometimes used in startups and shutdowns, and it's a pretty reliable way to monitor the reactor, the refractory temperature changes. So yeah, this table um, it's good for comparing, like using a comparison with your instrumentation, your thermal couples or your uh, optical parameter. It's really good for startups and shutdowns. You can make sure you're heating up the vessel at a proper rate or cooling it in the shutdown. So that brings us to the waste heat boiler. It's attached to the back of the reaction furnace. This is also designed for severe service or high heat. It's a shell and tube heat exchanger, just like a normal condenser. And they can be one pass or two pass design. And a two pass design would be used when there's a hot gas bypass in place, which is a first stage reheater, sending some of that hot processed gas directly to the first converter. This refractory in the RF and the waste heat boiler protects the tube sheet from high temperatures um, and iron sulfide attack, which occurs at 350 degrees Celsius or higher. So the refractory protects from that. And this is where the bulk of the heat removal takes place. It can be as high as 1,000 degrees centigrade taken out by this guy. Typically, you know, from 1150 to 300 or something like that Celsius. And this leads to high pressure steam production, anywhere from 150 to 400 PSI steam produced from these waste heat boilers. And we got a couple pictures here. From the inside, looking at the tube sheet, you can see all the, refri the refractory bricks there on the outside. They've got some scaffold set up there, it's pretty sketchy scaffolding. Probably inspecting the refractory or fixing it. And then this picture shows some iron sulfide attack. And so that's where the refractory must have failed for whatever reason. And then we got the high temperature and the acidic nature, so we have iron sulfide attack. We hope that our refractory protects from that. So that brings us to condensers. These are also shell and tube type heat exchangers where the 
requires heat and sulfur removal. It's a, so it's a gas-liquid separation. And then these lead into sewer-type liquid sulfur rundowns. For the final condenser, we want to maintain an outlet temperature of 125 degrees Celsius. And this is to minimize the sulfur vapor carryover to the incinerator. With these condensers, we achieve low pressure steam production, anywhere from 15 PSI to 50 PSI. And that steam can be used as a boiler feed water preheater, or most commonly in heat tracing. And with these condensers, it's always the steam on the shell side and the sulfur product on the tube side. So now we get to take a look at a seal leg here. So what these do is pre prevent the process gas from blowing right into the sulfur pit or into atmosphere. So to do this, the seal legs must be deep enough to ensure that the column head pressure of the liquid sulfur is greater than the maximum combustion air blower discharge pressure. So that'll bring us to reheaters. Reheaters increase the process gas temperature to avoid condensation of produced sulfur in the converters. So the process gas leaves the condenser at the sulfur dew point temperature. This temperature must be increased to bring us to the Klaus reaction temperature and bring us into the gas phase in the converters. We have direct fired methods or indirect fired methods. And with these, the key thing to remember is that we're trying to maintain our 2 to 1 ratio throughout the entire SRU. So you can probably guess which ones are going to affect the ratio and which ones aren't. Direct fired reheating methods. So we'll talk about some pros of these. They're very flexible for temperature control and for turn down scenarios because you're burning the process gas or fuel gas. It's a simplified air to fuel gas ratio or an air to acid gas ratio depending on what you're burning with a simple temperature set point on the burner, burner management system. And they're excellent for heat soaking converters as well. But then some cons. We have continuous trace oxygen carryover to the downstream converter. And this is a reversible catalyst deactivation mechanism called sulfation. And that happens because depending if we're burning fuel gas or acid gas, we're going to be burning at a stoichiometry anywhere from 75 to 90 percent. So you're always going to have that continuous trace amount of oxygen carrying over and risking sulfation. And then the big one, the big con about direct fired is that they add additional sulfur bearing compounds to the process. And this is immediately going to lower the practicable overall recovery efficiency of the SRU. And so for a second stage converter, this can look like about 0.1% uh, loss because of the added sulfur compounds. And then for the third stage, like it's as high as 0.5% just from a direct fired reheater. That's the losses. So indirect fired is the better way to go. But first we'll talk about the hot gas bypass. Also a direct heating method, and this is where a portion of the furnace outlet goes straight into the first converter. And these hot gas bypasses are only used for first stage. Since sulfur vapor is a product in the equilibrium limited Klaus reaction, the added vapor from the hot gas bypass decreases the full potential of the Klaus reaction in the first converter. So it's just like the downstream stages with the direct fired reheaters. They are, however, very low maintenance, easy to install, low cost. But a big con is you have no flexibility when that one control valve gets damaged or stuck, which we have seen 
think luckily the one client got stuck at about 90%, so it wasn't too bad, but you lose all your temperature control when that happens. So now we get on to the best reheating method, indirect. So this obviously uses steam typically, but it will not change the composition of the processed gas. There's no added compounds, sulfur compounds or anything like that. And it's also simple control. There's no effect on the practic practicable overall recovery efficiency. We have efficient heat transfer in this. And like I said, there's no additional sulfur bearing species added. They are, however, the most expensive, especially with the steam heated ones. I know in the US, um, some refineries, the steam costs like five bucks a ton, so that gets pricey real fast. And they do have a potential for more costly and difficult repairs. It's just a little more complex, but works a lot better. So that'll bring us to our converters. This is where the catalytic reaction occurs with that 2 to 1 H2S to SO2 ratio. It's an exothermic reaction. We'll see heat released and we'll see a temperature rise in the catalyst bed. So fully active catalyst will allow for a full equilibrium to be achieved. The Klaus reaction is favored at lower temperatures like we mentioned before. So temperature control is vital. We want our processed gas to be in the gas phase. Thanks to the reheaters, we can do that. Now in the first converter, we often see titania catalyst. But in the downstream, second, third, fourth stages, typically we only have alumina. That's all you need. The titania promotes hydrolysis of COS and CS2 but it's more sensitive to contaminants and deactivation mechanisms like high heat. So what we recommend in the first converter is to have mostly titania, a good bottom layer, a couple feet of that catalyst, and then maybe six inches to a foot of alumina catalyst on top. And that's to protect the more sensitive titania catalyst. And then with that setup, oftentimes in turnarounds, you'll see all they have to do is skim the top alumina that's been deactivated. They don't even have to replace the titania because it was protected and it's still in good shape. So that's a really nice setup for your first converter. So that's what catalyst can look like. Klaus catalyst can stay active for up to 15 years if the deactivation mechanisms are consistently mitigated. Catalyst can be thermally degraded, mechanically loaded with sulfur, or chemically poisoned by contaminants such as BTEX, methanol, and hydrocarbons. So like I said before, the first converter always runs hotter in order to maximize the hydrolysis of COS and CS2. And that means converting the unwanted byproducts back into SO2. That's what hydrolysis is. So for the first converter, SRE recommends a temperature of 340 degrees Celsius for alumina and 315 degrees Celsius for titania catalyst. And then with the mix setups, it depends on the, the portions that are mixed, but it could, our temperature recommendation could fall anywhere between there. Maybe 330 or something for a nice mix. Then the downstream converters run cooler so that we can maximize the Klaus reaction. That's that dew point margin I was talking about. This means a recommended operating temperature of 10 degrees centigrade above the sulfur dew point temperature. And those are always bed specific. So that could be anywhere from 160 to 200 or even 220 degrees Celsius. And that's the second, third, fourth stage converters. This is a cross section of a typical converter setup. We can see the process gas coming in the top and back out the bottom. This is where we often see the mix of alumina with titania catalyst. Nice picture of three converters here. Each has a condenser like it should. And these look pretty big in the picture, but they're honestly, I would consider these to be medium sized for a Klaus plant. 
we've seen much bigger. We've also seen a little smaller than this. And the size of the converters reflects the processing capacity of the SRU. And so nowadays, like it's pretty common to see big, huge converters, especially in North America, but they're turned way down, so they're way bigger than they need to be. And this is a nice little graph showing the different states of Catalyst, depending on deactivation. And so this is all about the temperature profile, right? So the top curve, the A curve, shows a temperature rise for fully active Catalyst, where the reaction happens in the top layer. So top layer is fully active, and then we hit equilibrium pretty quickly. The second curve shows some partial uniform deactivation, where the reaction just takes a little bit longer to reach thermal equilibrium doesn't quite achieve it in the top layer, so it's going down to the middle or middle bottom layers once it hits the top temperature from the reaction. Then that S-curved, S-shaped curve shows catalyst where the top layers have been deactivated, but the bottom are still active. And that could be due to catalyst poisoning, any sort of deactivation mechanism that happened just to the top layer. It could be from sulfur laydown, And so we still achieve the thermal equilibrium just lower down. And the top layer didn't really do anything on that graph. And then our final bottom curve there, the D curve, shows severe uniform deactivation where the Klaus reaction cannot achieve equilibrium. You can see it just didn't, didn't hit the same temperature as the other three did. So the Klaus reaction was not completed. It didn't hit equilibrium. And that brings us to the incinerator. Here's a picture of one. We have the burner and the incinerator chamber, which is the horizontal section. And then that goes into the vertical stack where the SO2 is vented. And this is a picture, a nice picture of one that melted through. So what happens when your incinerator runs too hot. Typically, the temperature and the chamber should not exceed 650 degrees Celsius. And that's controlled by the amount of fuel gas and air being burned. And we'll get to why this might have happened here, I think, in the next slide. So what it does is converts the remaining off gas into SO2, which is then released out of the top of the stack. SO2 concentrations at ground level are monitored to ensure there's proper plume dispersion. And that plume dispersion is a function of stack height, adequate temperature, and flow rate. So yeah, our temperature range is anywhere from 550 to 650, hopefully not hotter than that. The optimal stoichiometric burn in the incinerator allows for 2 to 4 percent excess oxygen in the stack. Any higher than that, and that will cause uh, CO2 production to be too high. The thing with these oxygen analyzers is they're not the most reliable due to the acidic nature of the stack gas. And then that final point is the sort of the important one there. It's valuable because the more sulfur species that are remaining in the tail gas, the more fuel gas will be needed to convert it to SO2. So it's important to understand that the normal, what the normal conditions should look like. And that's where the one that melted through, something wrong happened with the process control, but they probably had a pretty poor performance with the SRU. And then they had a high amount of sulfur species in the tail gas going to the incinerator. So the control saw this high amount of sulfur species and sent more fuel gas because it needed to burn those off. So it sent more and more fuel gas and more oxygen, and whatever must have happened, it would have been instrumentation or something, high, high alarm didn't go off, whatever happened, but it just kept getting higher and melted right through it. So it goes back to the importance of our instrumentation.